worked with the NRC at all before. Okay, Jeremy um Griffin was our former director. Um, so I think you guys might be on our email list, but I am trying to connect with all of the partners. Show me the same email and they both left. So I gotcha. Well, here, let me. Okay. If that's if it's okay, let me just go ahead and update y'all's email then while we're here. That's okay. Let me pull up our contact sheets. Then we had a group come out for the bed race. A couple of students came. Yeah. This year. He only stayed for like a little. Hmm. It was awkward. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> oh no. Oh gosh. Oh gosh. <laughs> That's really funny. Huh. Okay, I'm trying to find where. I'm sure it wasn't as bad as it seemed. <laughs> oh no. Okay. Oh, geez. Okay, so I'm going to, which email is gonna be the best? Sheree, S-H-A-R-S-H-A-R-S-H-A-R-S-H-A-R-S-H-A-R-S-H-A-R-S-H-A-R-S-H-A-R-S-H-A-R-S-H-A-R-S-H-A-R-S-H-A-R-S-H-
Lots of coordinating. Yeah. Do you guys have to move around a lot and travel? Hi. Hi. <laughs> What's up? Um, Tasha went and got peaceful pads. Huh? Tasha went and got peaceful pads. So, um, where are they? They're so in the parking garage. Right? They're walking up. Yeah, true. No? Um, I'm not sure. We were communicating with Rafaela a little bit, but oh, yeah, but I'm not sure if she's coming. They're meeting. Oh. Yeah. Okay. I don't think they do here. I think, I mean, you can come chill if you yeah. want. Okay, cool. Um, sounds good. That was Sonai, and she's also a student leader at the VCLS. Um, and yeah, I think she's gonna come. I think our VCLS students will hopefully come and show up. Um, it was very loud. We'll close the door when you guys start presenting. <laughs> I do a little bit of a Oh gosh, are you taking classes at Santa Fe? Yeah. It's yeah, it's quite confusing here. Hey, how are you? Good. Okay. Um, this is our family promise team. <laughs> Pasha just ran down to grab peaceful paths from the parking garage, but it's like three miles away from here. Not really, but kind of. Yeah. What elevators? What are like Yeah, there's well, there's two sets of elevators and the further set goes down more floors than the set over here. So it's like, what's going on? Like the building is inconsistent. It's so confusing. <laughs> oh, it's so confusing. You know, they need they need more like maps that are hanging around. Yeah. Uh huh. Here's like, and we've got lost. Hello. Yeah. Oh, here. Let's just like. Um. Do you guys want to? Are you guys going to stand up to present? Awesome. Okay, yeah, so wherever you guys are, are comfortable. Yes, yes. Yes. Um, not on his. How long is this? If they're going to be watching, I want to know. Hi, Aiden. What's up? Okay. Yeah. Or is this like a cool I'm Rachel? I don't want to walk in the middle. Um, okay, I'll be. I have a meeting after me with someone, but I want to bring up so I'm going to back and like Diego newsletter <laughs> next Wednesday is the due date. Is that true? Is the newsletter coming out next Wednesday or next Friday? This is our meeting. Yeah. Next Wednesday. That's okay.
very bad. <laughs> It was just it was fun. I go around, I go around like four times. Yeah. I feel because when I came for the conference, I had to work way like we had twelve lights. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, I know we're in another parking garage, but I don't want to fight the box. No one's doing the NRC meeting yet, oh, okay. which is so interesting because normally we have like, oh, Belina just joined. Yeah. Hi, Belina. Hi. Oh, hello. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Um, We're waiting on more people to join. <laughs> normally, normally we do a lot more, but... um. We are live in this room <laughs> with, our, with um, Family Promise, who's going to be giving their presentation. And then Tasha just ran down to grab people from Peaceful Paths, and they'll give a presentation as well. Great. Um, so we're just waiting to start a little bit. OK. Um, I was wondering, before we get, since we have a minute, um, what is the best email address to reach you at? To reach me, um, probably, okay, so I will respond to the NRC email, but I'm like yeah. constantly on my UF email. Um, I saw that you just messaged me on the um, wow. NRC email and I like made a note in my head to respond to that after this. Um, but probably if you if you want to just get in touch with me more quickly, um cordal at ufl.edu. Okay, got it. It's a good one. Thank you. Yes. Of course. Um, and I will coordinate with Tasha before the end of this week to send out communication to you. Um and possibly repurpose project. Um Okay. Yeah, to, to coordinate. Next. Okay, sounds great. Hi, Abigail. Hi. How are you? Good, how are you? Doing well, thank you. Um, Tasha just ran down to get our other partners. Um, Family Promise is here and Peaceful Paths is trying to figure out all of their parking and craziness because Rights Union is not a fun place to show up. Um. So, so we're gonna just wait a couple minutes to get started. Um, okay. You guys are here though. I don't know if you saw in the email that I sent out before this, but um, because we have our partners presenting, there won't really be as much time to like go into details. And so I put that form on there. Um, I filled it out. I just did it super last minute. <laughs> no, that's okay. I haven't even checked it yet. I was just gonna check after the meeting. So um, we'll include that in the follow-up email and then in the newsletter that'll come out next Wednesday. Cool. Cool. And um Belina, same for CWC. Cool. I um, saw that in the times that you were looking for volunteer availability, you didn't have weekend days on there. Really? Okay. Yeah, it was only like Monday through Friday. Okay. Did you make a note somewhere? Oh, okay. I figured I'd just tell you. <laughs> yeah. Um I mean, do you guys need volunteers for? Um... Well, I I put it like in the section where I spoke about volunteer um stuff. I said specifically what days. Okay. You know. Okay. Um, but yeah, <laughs> I don't want to confuse anybody. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. I did not make a note of that anywhere, but we also have um opportunities on the weekends. Yeah. That sounds good. But all of our opportunities are scheduled around our volunteer availability, so it's all flexible. Okay, that sounds good. Um, I think we're gonna go ahead and start with Family Promise because they're here and they're ready, and we have people who are waiting. So, 
I'm going to go ahead and give the floor to them so that they can introduce themselves. Um, and this is recorded, so we'll send it out later as well. I think we're at eight now <laughs> that actually serve families and host on site. Um, and of those eight, we're kind of only four actually are actually hosting on site. Others are giving meals or money so we can put the families in hotels. We also expanded to include rapid rehousing, which immediately takes the families out of shelter, or out of their cars or wherever they are in their homeless situation and places them into housing. And we, for up to a year, we can pay their rent. We can encourage the new case manager to go back to school. We have partnerships that do certifications in phlebotomy, CNA, other career fields, so that when they finish that year in our program, hopefully they'll be stable and able to maintain housing on their own. What we're seeing now in the community is just a drastic increase in housing cost. Um, some of the families that stabilized over the years found themselves coming back because their rent went from 800 a month to 1200 a month in one year, which if you're a family on a budget, a $400 increase is just not doable <laughs> for anybody in any circumstances. So we are finding that even families who you would believe were stable, we have families that are teachers, we have families that are police officers, we have ones that they're working, we call it the hidden homeless, or they're working poor. And they're working and trying their best to stay ahead. It's just the economy and the situation that we're facing right now is preventing them. And many of them, because they're working, don't qualify for a lot of government assistance. So not only can they not sustain their housing as they are, they can't go get help anywhere else. So we have a couple of initiatives to help those families. We started the Alice Project, which is basically private funds that we get from those in the community that help those families who are, we call them like cliff families, that ones that make too much, of course, to qualify for any type of assistance, but make too little to sustain their own housing. Because at Family Promise, we believe that every child, regardless of economic status, deserves a home. And a lot of times those families are overlooked because they're like, oh, they're working, they're fine. <laughs> they don't need the assistance, they need it more. In all actuality, homelessness and that struggle is trauma. And you don't wanna anybody, regardless of economic status, religion, race, you don't want anybody to live in a constant state of trauma. And that's what a lot of our families are going through. That's what a lot of new families are going through because of the impacts of COVID, of the increases in the rent and everything. They've never experienced this before. So this is like a new traumatic experience. And we don't want them to go down to the path where that's a constant. Like we do have families where that is their constant state of life. They're constantly in a state of trauma. They're constantly in that high stress survival mindset. And it's very hard once you've been in it for generations for that mindset to change. So our goal is trying to prevent 
that from even happening in the first place, finding, providing them a safe place to come, to get the assistance they need, and even inspire them to go further in their lives. That's it. Question about so how can people get involved with Family Promise and how can we volunteer with you guys? So we do, like I said, we still have a few of our rotations going. So if you want to get a quick 12 hours of volunteer service, you can just spend the night at one of our churches with our families, and that is a quick 12, easy 12 hours. We also, you can do meals um, at the churches with our families. We also are looking for, we're trying to do more classes, more life skills classes. So if that's something that your degree or that your field is in and you want to do a class like on mindfulness or do a class on motivational interviewing, do a class on employability skills, anything that you, wherever your field of study is, you can come, you can say, hey, I would like to do a group session with your people and we can help set that up and have it in the evenings because a lot of them work. <laughs> so it will be like an evening class that we can set up for you guys and you can come and do that. If you wanna do, we had a while back, something called Photo Voice um, in which we gave kids in our program who don't really have a voice because when your parents are struggling, you really don't wanna ask for what you need or what you <laughs> want because you don't want that anxiety to increase in your parents. So Photo Voice allowed us to give that child a camera and take pictures of anything. Like we had student volunteers come in, they walked all downtown and took pictures of whatever they wanted to take pictures of. <laughs> and then they wrote a little narrative. So we have so many impactful stories that came out of that, the picture and the narrative that was helped by US students as well. So there's a lot of different opportunities. And if you want to be creative, just come to me. We can brainstorm ideas and we can help make it happen. Like I said, um, it's important to give our families that support to tell them that they are supported in the community when a lot of times they felt left out or ignored. What is the best way to get in touch with you guys? Um, you would be in my email okay. is a good way. Um, or if you want, like I said, you want to go through your group and say, hey, we want to schedule a brainstorming. Mm -hmm. <laughs> kind of like this session with you. You can do that and we can sit, sit down and brainstorm and you can throw the ideas at me and I can come. We will come up with some programs that we can help with our families. Do you guys have any questions? Do people usually plan for volunteering through the churches themselves who are hosting the site or do they do it directly to you? It's either or. Um, like, I really, if you would come to me, I can kind of partner you with the churches that are most in need of volunteers because we have a lot of churches, especially downtown, that depend on <laughs> student volunteers like First Pres and First United Methodist. They depend heavily on student volunteers to help them with their hosting sessions. Um, so when, like, if you're interested in that, just hit me up and I can link you with those churches. Um, are they are opportunities around the office, like uh, for for student volunteer positions around the office or within, you know, the office space, if they're not necessarily wanting to, you know, to do an overnight stay or um or are not able to do that. Right? Yes. So we do right now we have <laughs> we have a project that we are absolutely needing help with. We have four storage units that are overflowing. So if you like to organize <laughs> To help us declutter our storage units so we can see exactly what we have for our families. Because when we house them, we like to make sure they have everything they need. So that's why we have four storage units. But now we have like an organ in there. I was like, nobody wants an organ. Why is there an organ in our storage unit? So we are looking for volunteers to help us um, with organization. Um, we have the beautification thing where we you can come in and help beautify our day center. Like right now, our actually a tree fell on our shed mm -hmm. and our AC unit um, because of the storm. So we're trying to clean up the tree <laughs> right now and patch the hole that's in our shed. So that's an option too. Um, organizing files, if that's something you want to do, we have you can do that as well with our file management. Um, we are hoping in the near future that we will have an actual static site shelter 
in which you will be, that will give you more opportunities and we are going to be painting, doing flooring, doing all kinds of stuff. So that will be a major opportunity for you guys to come in and <laughs> help us for those that want to do more manual type stuff. Right. So for the so basically you would come in at 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. And it's basically you have your own, our family sleep in Sunday school room. So you'd have your own Sunday school room with your own bed and your own area. So you don't really have to engage. You can't engage. I encourage you to engage with the families. But <laughs> they usually go to bed around 9. So if you wanted to do like a small activity with the kids while the parents keep impressed, you could do that at 7. And everybody turns in at 9. And out of the seven years I've been there, the only emergency <laughs> that we had is somebody went into labor. <laughs> well, then you just call 911. <laughs> but other than that, it's like an easy 12. Like, um, it's 18 and up. So, yeah, to do it by yourself. We do, like, if you want to do it as a family, if, yeah, you can bring your child with you. Don't discriminate about that. But yeah, it's an easy 12 hours. Nobody usually bothers anybody. They wake up, they fix their breakfast, and they're off to work. And then you're off to wherever you need to be at 7 a.m. We do do a trauma informed care training. That's something that I would do personally with them just to make sure they understand how somebody might react. Like I always give the example of the casserole, like sometimes <laughs> you might cook a casserole and you think it's the best casserole in the world and that our guests might eat it and be like, and not say, show you the gratitude that you expect, but you have to understand they're going through a traumatic event and they are not focused on your casserole, they're focused on how I'm going to get housed or how I'm going to get a job or when, what's going to happen with my kids tomorrow. So just understanding where they are and understanding the kind of reactions that you may or may not get from them when you're interacting with them, it's important. So you don't, like I said, you don't ever want to take anything personally because you don't know what that person is going through. And it's not anything personal against you. It's just if they're overwhelmed and they lash out and you yell at them for not liking your casserole, probably going to get a whole lot of years worth of stuff that has nothing to do with you or the casserole. It's just the pot overflowed at a time and then that's what happened. Um, but we, like I said, we never really had any issues like that with our families that were in our program. Um, but we do do that type of training so they can understand if they're, or know the signs if somebody's overwhelmed or something, how to either stay back or help decompress. <laughs> Awesome. Well, if you guys don't have any more questions, um, thank you so much mm -hmm. for, for being so <laughs> Um, peaceful pause. Yeah, Did you guys? There, there is. Yes, perfect. <laughs> Uh, how are Zoom people doing? <laughs> good. Thumbs up. No <laughs> comment. Okay. Sounds good. Like yeah. Is it good for Zoom? Yes. Okay. So I am Crystal Sorrow. I am the Director of Education and Youth Programs for Peaceful Paths. And so um, I work with the children of survivors that come into our programs. And I also go out into the community to do education. 
So we're going to talk a little bit today about intimate partner violence, domestic violence, and then we're also going to talk about the services we provide and how to get involved. So I'm going to let my co-hosts introduce themselves. Uh, hello, my name is Rafaela. Uh, I am outgoing slash current community outreach liaison, which is like fancy for well, here for me. So we are going to talk about intimate partner violence some, so I just want to let you know that that can sometimes bring on feelings or situations, so if you need to step out, if you need to take some time for yourself, we definitely encourage and respect that. So domestic violence, intimate partner violence are way more common than most people realize. We put up some these are blurry statistics <laughs> for you. So I can translate them. Um, 20 people per minute are physically abused by an intimate. And you can see in one day in 2019, Florida domestic violence shelters and programs, there's 41 certified in the state served over 3,000 adults and children, but 172 requests on that specific day went unmet because of resources. Um, the highest age is 18 to 24 statistically. And if you think about maybe that pace of life, leaving support systems, coming into new environments, maybe being in a long-term relationship for the first time, those can be some of the factors. So we wanna talk a little bit about intersectionality. Um, as individuals, we have different identities, right? We have different backgrounds. We have different things that make up how we identify and who we are. And what that means when people come into services is that they may face different resource barriers. They may face different issues that you as a person may not. There's gonna be different stories for each individual and there's gonna be different challenges. People may already have experience in some of the systems that we're like referring them to or that we're trying to access resources through. So just being aware that how everyone experiences violence may be different, but their challenges may also be different when they come into programs. And even when you deal with a friend or someone who's going through things, realizing that everyone's story is not the same, but also how they are going to want to um, address things that they're going through and also the goals they have may be different. So these are some statistics people may be unaware of. We want to be really clear that intimate partner violence can happen to anyone and any type of relationship. So um, in the LGBTQ community, the highest statistic is actually for bisexual women. Um, Women who have experienced dating violence, there are definitely long-term health consequences. They're three times as likely to meet the criteria for anxiety disorder or PTSD. And then women of color do experience intimate partner violence at a rate 30 to 50% higher than white women. Um, and among college students, 70% who were in an abusive relationship didn't realize they were at the time and 40% kept the abuse private and didn't tell others about it. So it's important that people become more educated about it so that they can be an ally. And it's also important that people become educated about it so they understand the dynamics. So domestic violence and intimate partner violence involve patterns of abusive behaviors, and it's all about power and control. So it's about establishing power and control over the other person in the relationship. This is the power and control wheel. And if you've never seen this before, the outside layer that physical and sexual violence is what people think of typically when they think of intimate partner violence. And there's typically that threat. But when people talk to survivors, um, and this wheel goes back a ways, there are different versions of it. But when they talk to survivors, they found out that strategies were often very the same. And that it wasn't always physical and sexual violence, there was also emotional abuse, there was also isolation, there's also using technology, there's the minimizing, the denying, the blame. And physical and sexual violence have crimes that go with that, but like emotional abuse, that's more a strategy that's used. There's not a specific crime where you can go to someone and say, this is what's happening. Um, so we want to make sure that people know that that is still abuse, and that these are one of the things that we address. 
So putting a partner down, making them feel guilty, um, calling them names, even keeping them up at night, unable to study, uh, interrupting their sessions, isolating them from friends, from families, from interests they have, wanting that person to be um, dependent on them for all forms of like, communication, deleting contacts, um, wanting you to share your location at all times, monitoring your location at all times, controlling what's put up on social media, um, making light of abuse, not taking responsibility for it. There's no accountability. And then economic abuse. Economic abuse is something that um, is talked about a lot with survivors. We have a whole economic empowerment program that works on housing stability and things like that as well. But if you think of all the ways partners can be connected with money, whether that's rent, whether that's financial accounts, whether that's childcare, all those little things, just being able to see your bank account online and monitoring what money is coming out how much gas you're spending, how many miles you're putting on your car. So all those kinds of things. And then coercion and threats. So that could be threatening a partner, but it could also be threatening themselves. If you leave me, I'll commit suicide. If you leave me, I'm gonna um, involve myself in dangerous activities. And using intimidation. So even if there isn't that physical violence yet, the throwing things or smashing things or breaking phones, all those pieces as well. So some red flags in relationship. Um, some of these we're told are positives, right? It was so intense at the beginning. Um, or if they're jealous, that, that means they're really into me. These are actually very problematic behaviors. So we want people to be aware that littling, deflecting responsibility, that guilting in a relationship, not being able to have equal communication, that those are all problematic behaviors. And we also want people to avoid judging or blaming survivors. And if you haven't learned much about dynamics, it's easy to say, why does that person stay? I never stay in that relationship. But what you have to realize is it's not the survivor's fault. It is a choice the abuser, the batterer makes. So you want to be really careful about the language you use, especially with survivors, um, because no one does anything to cause abuse. And just like we talked about with all the intersections, there's a lot of barriers to leaving, right? This is someone they love, they've built a relationship with. They may believe that this is a one-time thing, it's not going to happen again. There may be a lot of behaviors after violence happens that makes the person believe that things are going to be better. If they have children, there could be that keeping the family together, right? Or religious reasons, one of those identity, identity overlaps. Um, there can be fear of more abuse or it escalating, fear of police involvement, right? Loss of custody or harm to reputation. What are people going to think about me? And they believe the threats that the abuser uses to harm themselves or to pull family or friends into it, your roommate, those kinds of things. And then that financial constraints. The first year after someone leaves is the most dangerous. So if we know it's about power and control, as that person tries to leave, the batterer is losing power and control over that person, right? So things can escalate then. So it's really important to understand that it's not easy as, why don't they just leave? There is no just to it. So people may be thinking, what about school? They're in my classes, they're on campus. I see them all the time. I rent with them. What am I going to do about housing? I can't just leave. Um, will my friends believe me? Will people believe me? They have my passwords. They post us looking perfect on social media. How do I move forward? So there's all these thoughts and more that could be going through someone's head if they're in this situation. So that's where we hopefully come in. We provide resources for Alachua, Bradford, and Union counties, we're tri-counties. So if you don't know Bradford, have y'all driven through Stark? So Stark is on the <laughs> Stark is on the way to Jacksonville. And um, so we do have offices in Stark and Lake Butler. We do support groups out in Stark as well for adults and children. So we do serve all three counties. So students mostly know Alachua County and mostly campus, but we provide services for survivors all three.
I have my beautiful picture that was in that one. Okay. <laughs> um it could be yeah, like that. You have guys. Okay. Any questions so far? Any questions? Yeah. You're do they have here. No, they can come to the office. We have, we have rural advocates and they are actually out in those counties at least one day a week. So the schedule might be a little different, but they are also out there. And we also have a legal team that um, do mostly injunctions for protection, but they're also out in those counties to do those court dates. So it's possible to meet with like attorneys out in the rural counties, and it's also possible to meet with advocates out in the county. Um, okay. Anyone? Okay. okay. It's all good. Um, and we're going to show uh, statistics of all of our services, but basically we do have an emergency shelter and the average stay in emergency shelter is about six weeks. So some people stay shorter than that. They're just looking for a couple of days so they can get with family or friends or other things. Some people stay that amount of time. We have case managers and advocates there who meet with the people. We work off an empowerment model. So it's seeing what people need, where they're at, what their priorities are, and then helping them to um, shore up resources behind those things. So, but we also have outreach offices. So people don't need to have to need shelter to come in. They can come in for a variety of reasons. Even if someone just wants to talk about their relationship and be like, I don't know, something feels off, something feels problematic. Um, so there's advocates nine to five, Monday through Friday, who can meet with people in Gainesville and talk with them. Um, I'm with child and youth. So when adults come in to like meet with a advocate, the children can come over and play with us. We do a lot of Uno and pretend food in the kitchen so that they have like a warm spot to go while their parents have those conversations. Um, we do serve all genders of survivors are welcome. Um, we have all genders of survivors and shelter as well. Um, so yeah, we actually are one of the few shelters that also do pets. So if someone's leaving and their pet has been threatened or they're worried about leaving their pet, they can bring their pet with them. We do have a pet room um, and we provide pet supplies. So dog food, cat food, we've had birds, we've had turtles. At the old shelter, there was even a pot belly pig guy here. Um, and we're working on building like a bigger dog run so that we have a small one, but so that the dogs can actually go outside and like really exercise. Um, so yeah, we also, we have the legal team, which I talked about. We have the economic empowerment team. So they work with people mostly on sustainable housing, but also like writing resumes and, um, applying for jobs and interviewing and all those things as well. And then Roth is going to talk about like ways to get involved. So um, we do fundraisers and our fundraisers are, we have a variety of different types we do. Um, you can also do donation drives. So food, hygiene items, children's items. Um, we have some season specific ones, like we have a Halloween festivities thing every year so we try to get people to donate costumes and goodie bag stuff so we can provide that to the kids oh, it's Here not it's not working but it's fine it's not a big deal some pictures and stuff so all the important information I don't know. yeah you know so um, i will tag raff in to talk about uh volunteering so a bunch of different ways to get involved um crystal kind of talked about a few of them already some are on our campus, some are through events, some are through long-term volunteering or internships, and then some are through donation drives. Um, yeah, we'll go through all of them. Uh, I would say right now, the most important things that we need is donation drives for sure, basic needs, hygiene items. We have people come into our campus every single day to get stuff from our pantry. It could be food, it could be diapers, it could be shampoo, it could be 
pads, tampons, it could be anything that they need um, just to get through that day or that week. So always trying to refresh what is in our pantries and what we can provide for survivors. Um, specifically seasonal events or fundraising opportunities, I'll jump into that because that's our next biggest uh, initiative for the fall. Um, but that includes a lot of volunteering. And then again, fundraising is always needed as well. Here's my beautiful, no pictures, but the important information is there. Imagine it and you're Yeah, mind. just, you're a volunteer looking yeah. like you're having lots of fun. There's lots of amazing, beautiful pictures, but um, there's three different versions of volunteering opportunities uh, at People Path. Long-term, it just means that you are willing to give a certain amount of time, a couple hours a week, every week for at least a semester, um, just to help out. And that could be in almost any of our departments. It could be with childcare. It could be with our outreach support. That, that involves sorting donations, helping out um, with organizations, sorting the pantries, making sure we have what we need to be able to provide the services that we offer. Um, we also offer uh, events and groups. So again, events, we have a lot of fundraising opportunities and events that we provide for the community to raise funds for our services, as well as create awareness for the community, um, which I'll be talking about one in a moment. We also have group volunteering. We have groups from campuses or different organizations, businesses come to our campus and help out in different ways. Um, that could be, again, organizing things or helping us sort through our donation center, we get a lot of like furniture and things like that. So we want to make sure that what we have isn't just sitting there and it's actually just going to a survivor who needs it. Um, finally, internships. We do offer internships, again, for a lot of our departments. Um, mainly it's child and youth. We have a development department that does a lot of things, fundraising, marketing, social media, all things kind of communication. Um, we have an outreach support, which involves getting trained on how to talk on the phone with our helpline, how to reach survivors, how to help them get to an advocate when needed. Um, we also have residential support, which is through our shelter, as well as housing advocacy and economic environment. Um, and we just added legal advocacy as well. So we have a whole legal team that also looks for interns to help out in that department. And the intern commitment's more like 10 hours. Yes. So like long-term volunteering would be like less than 10 and interning would be like 10 or more. Yeah. Long-term volunteers, um, very, very flexible. Depends on your scheduling. Um, we know, you know, there might be days where you can't come, you're on vacation, you're sick, et cetera. Um, and that's okay. Internships, it's more based on what your academic requirements are. So we want to make sure you meet those 200 hours or whatever it is that is. Um, but lots of volunteers, we've had people who've been volunteering with us for years and come in every, you know, Wednesday afternoon just to sort the clothing. Um, and those people are absolutely essential to ensure that we're able to do the things that we do because advocates don't have time to do that. And our, you know, staff doesn't have time to do that because we're out helping. Cool. Um, any specific questions on this before I... How do people apply for the internships and get in touch with you guys to come and volunteer? Sure. So for internships, currently we're looking at spring summer internships. Um, we do get a lot of applicants, so we usually recommend applying fairly early in the spring. If you apply right now, you'll we'll probably just tell you to hold off. Um, but typically, like December, January is when we'll start. Um, getting those applications. And all of that is on our website. There's a QR code at the very end that has all the information in for you. Um, another beautiful, you no, know, just imagination station here. Um, we are having a very, very, very big event October 5th. Um, it's our signature event. Uh, it's called Guest Chef Gainesville. It's a food based event, it has over 400 people attend. So obviously we need a lot of volunteers to make it all work, but it's the event that we raise the most amount of money for, for the organization. So we put a lot 
see it. Um, and it's like little tasting stations. Yeah. So there's like professional chefs, home cooks that um, volunteer to come in and make one tasting mm -hmm. each. And then people can walk around, taste the food, hear a speaker, usually a survivor, mm -hmm. to get a little more information about what we're doing in the community. Yeah. And that, and we also have a giant like silent auction as well. And all of that needs help putting it together. So we have a variety of different opportunities for volunteers. It could be as simple as driving around the community and picking up auction items, or it could be helping us cut, you know, creative materials for the auction, or it could be setting up at the venue, or it could be day of serving food or helping the chefs or helping the valet or whatever else there may be there. You're good at tying bows. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Someone put a basket. Crystal's so, our basket, yeah, ladies. So. You're good at tying bows. Apply that. Yeah. Um, that link actually just went live. So I will make sure to send that out um, so that you all can get it. But that is also available on our website. Again, lots of opportunities. And I think it starts end, technically now, but end of September through the first week of October leading up to the event is when we'll need the most amount of volunteers for sure. So if you have any questions while you're looking at that, um, definitely let me know and I'll let, I'll give you what you need. Uh, but yeah, lots of fun stuff for that one. Um, again, imagination station here, initiatives and drives. Fall is definitely the biggest, most busiest time of the year for us. Um, not only do we have guest chefs coming up, we also do a lot of things throughout the year. So right after Guest Chef in October and November, we'll do an event, um, an initiative called Neighborly November, where we'll collect donations, non-perishable foods, um, and meal kits for families. They register, we make them a meal kit, and they can take it home and cook a Thanksgiving meal together. Um, that is a huge need <laughs> um we usually have i think last year we had the most amount of families we've ever um had apply but it can range between 50 plus families that want um a meal kit and again that can be a single survivor it could be a big family small family we want to make sure everyone has something um, to pick together so that is neighborly november coming up and then in this November and December, right after they all just kind of back to back to back, we have our holiday giving program. That is also probably our biggest initiative of the year. During the holidays, it can be a very traumatic and stressful time for people um, in these situations, especially families. And we wanna be able to provide basically their holiday wish list. They give us their wish list that's on things that they want for their themselves, gifts. It could be things for the house. It could be things for their kids. Um, we have community members adopt those families and fulfill those wish lists. And then we have volunteers wrap gifts, organize, and make sure that we have um, something to give every family that applies. We help over, I think it's like 130 or so families every year, and that's typically on average, like a family of four or more. So a lot, a lot of people and a lot, a lot of organization and donations needed to be able to support that. Um, that will start, like I said, sometime in November. We accept adopting families. We accept general donations, um, monetary donations as well. Sometimes people can't find what they're looking for, so we can help with that as well. Um, and then, yeah, decorating, gift wrapping, all of that stuff is volunteer needed. We also do a little store where the kids can pick out things to give their families. Yes. So we'll ask for donations of like lotions and just little items that they can wrap up for either a parent or their sibling so that when it comes time for the holidays, they also feel like they're part of it. Yeah. Um, and again, I've already mentioned this, but an ongoing need is basic needs and hygiene drives. That can be as easy as just collecting a few items and dropping them off at our outreach. Those we are always in need of, um, especially hygiene items. Yeah, we get a lot of food and it's always rotating, but hygiene items, large full-size shampoos and deodorants and 
things like that um, are you and different textures of hair products yes. as well because sometimes people don't think about that when donating mm -hmm. um, or like baby shampoos baby washes mm -hmm. things you know um, but sometimes people bring hotel ones and those are great but you know those last like a day or two yeah. especially if you have a family so yeah. having like nice size you know and like a body wash to someone who doesn't have that typically yeah. can feel like a real luxury item um, and all of our basic needs lists uh, actually we brought a list of general things that we typically ask for all of that is also found on our website um, and if you have any questions about how best you can help or how you can do a drive or how you can get a group to do it something like that you can email me and a ladies a volunteer at peacefulpath.org um, and we can help you set up that as well and then i think the last thing on here is the qr code so and our pretend logo so and you can find information about all these lit things on our website yes so information about volunteering, information about internships, information about initiatives, up and coming, um, or right around the corner, like that stuff. Um, that's all on our website as well. So yeah. Does anyone have any questions? Thank you so much for having us. Yeah, like you. we're so excited. Thank you guys so much for coming. And part of the um mission of NRC is to connect different groups that are doing different work in the community to each other because you know yeah. there's lots of good networking that can happen and there are so many people who are so driven to do such good stuff and sometimes resources can be shared and mm -hmm. you know so this is a good opportunity to connect on that stuff and so I appreciate that and our partners on Zoom too. Yeah. And so I appreciate it as well. Yeah, we definitely love interconnecting and uh, yeah being able to let people know about the other so, thank you. Thank so you. Much. Thank you. Hello, Zoom people. <laughs> um, I am. Hi, Miss Abia. <laughs> um, does anyone have anything that they want to talk about that I can make note of to put into the email? I already added it into the form. Okay. Just good log groups from like now through the winter. Okay. And that's in um the document that I sent. Okay, perfect. Perfect. Um Belina and Stella. Nothing. No worries. Okay, <laughs> and thank you for your note about the mute mess. Yeah, that was really stupid. Okay. Um. Okay. So I'm gonna go ahead and end this meeting. Um. I will check out the document that I sent out. Um. For y'all's updates, and we'll include that in the the post meeting email and also um the newsletter. And as we table soon, um, we'll be kind of like pushing those for you guys. Um. If you guys have anything else, always feel free to reach out, let me know. And other than that, thank you guys so much for coming. Thanks. Thanks.